Um, this is the Network Charging Forum for Communities. This is all about how we pay for the network. It's an absolutely critical time to understand what's going on with how we pay for our energy network. And for communities, this has been a fundamental issue for the last 10 years or more. Um, it's been the biggest barrier to communities being able to generate their own energy locally in terms of the network being constrained and being faced with high costs to connect to the network. And that has implications for anyone thinking about local supply or how we um, localise the cost of our energy system. Um, so this forum hopefully is going to give you a bit more information about Ofgem's Minded 2 proposals on network access and forward-looking charges. This is part of a significant code review, which is a process that Ofgem go through. It's a formalised process to change the way that our um, energy system is governed. And that has massive potential impacts for not just local energy, but the future of our energy system as a whole and the decarbonisation of that as a consequence. So in this forum, we'll, we'll be explaining what all these changes mean. We'll be spending quite a lot of time with Timothy, who's a real expert on this, um, who's going to help us explore some of those impacts. And we're going to hopefully leave lots of time for questions as well. As I say, this forum is really about you getting the information you need. And the whole purpose is to help you understand what's going on so that you can respond yourselves to Ofgem's consultation to their Minded 2 minded two proposals. So it's about you influencing the final decisions of how we pay for this network in the future. As I say, this has been an absolutely fundamental issue for communities um, for over 10, well over 10 years. And we're gonna try and help you um, unpick some of the more challenging and intricate details. The consultation closes on the 25th of August, which is next week. Um, so we really, really want you to respond to that directly. And as we go through today, I'd really like to see lots of you um, raising your hand and, and engaging in this discussion as much as possible. So if you can have cameras on, that'd be brilliant. Um, Poppy has been working on this subject for well over two years now, and this is a process that has been going on for a very, very long time. Um, so she's a real expert on this and she said she's admitted herself she could talk for hours. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to uh, try and stop her talking for hours and make sure that um, you guys can ask all the questions you need, get all the information you want. Lovely. All right. Um, Kai's going to pop up the agenda so we can have a look at that. Um, we've got a little break in the middle because this is quite a challenging um, topic. It's quite detailed. It's quite full on. So we're going to give you a little break in the middle. And we're going to start off by um, introducing the, the significant, off general significant code review. We're going to talk about connection charging and access rights and transmission charging before we summarise and close at 12. Um, I'm going to let the team introduce themselves. Unfortunately, we haven't got time for everyone else to introduce themselves on this call, um, but we'll be using the chat function to do that. So if you can all introduce yourselves in the chat yeah, yeah. and I'm going to pass over to um, Poppy to introduce herself. I mean, myself. Thank you, uh, Jodie. Uh, yes, I'm Poppy. I'm the head of cities and regions at Regen. Um, and she says I've been doing this for quite a long time. I've been engaging with Ofgem on this uh, this significant code review and before that, before they launched it as well on various challenge groups. So I think it's actually three to four years, Jodie. Uh, um, so I hope I'll be able to um, enlighten you a little bit about what's going on and what the changes might be. Uh, I'm gonna try very much not to get too technical on you and Jodie's got some sort of clacks and she's gonna uh, throw at me when I, when I start to get too much into acronyms or, or too much detail. Um, but yes, that's me, thanks Jodie. Jody, I'm Kai Ho. I work alongside Jody on our communities program at Regen. Um, I've, yeah, we've done a number of these sorts of forums with WPD over the years and, and seen many of your faces a lot before. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to uh, getting your thoughts on this area, which Regen's been been looking at for quite a while. Um, so yeah, looking forward to the next two hours. Thanks, Kai. Christine. Hey everyone, I'm Christine Chapter. Um working with Jodie and Kai and Poppy at Regen, where I'm the Head of Innovation. And it's great to see some of you again and see some new faces too. 
And then we're going to go to the Western Power Distribution team. So Jenny. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny from the Innovation team, handing over community activities to Faithful. And nicely to Faithful. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Faithful. I used to work for the Innovation team until very recently when I moved into a new role, which is trying to shape how WPD works with um, the energy industry uh, in terms of, uh, I suppose, what we are discussing today. And so you'll probably be seeing more of me uh, going forward. Thanks, Faithful. Um, right, and that, uh, I think that's it for our introductions. Is there anyone else from WPD who has missed? Can't see anyone else on the call. Great, so we're going to go straight over to Poppy. I keep moving around my screen. Um, yes, yeah, so everyone's, uh, I've introduced myself, so we'll go on to the first slide, please, Kai. Um, so I wanted just to remind everybody about the electricity system that we're talking about here, and that we're, in this discussion, we are mainly talking about the distribution uh, level of the uh, electricity system. So you can see that is the bit that WPD are the main player in. Um, but just to flag that within obviously distribution, you've got a number of different voltage levels. So you've got um, an electricity network that serves our domestic sort of households, which is the low voltage at these low, uh, the distribution substations, but then you move all the way up to some really big um, big voltages at the top end where some some users do connect um, at that sort of level but just to remind you that we've got these different voltage levels and these will be uh, quite important when we come to some of the uh, proposals later on just to uh, flag that to everybody um, and the next thing uh, on the next slide to flag as well is that a lot of this is about money so this is just showing you a typical domestic bill. And when we talk about how much you pay for the network, obviously that is important for people paying bills, but it's important to understand that the, the money talks and that, that really how you pay for the network will also determine how it develops. And that's why this is so important in terms of uh, the future and for net zero uh, and supporting more um, low carbon generation. So this shows really that network costs are about 20% of your domestic bill. And there are three change, sort of three main charges within that. You've got how much you pay for the transmission network, which we call this TNUOS, which is transmission network use of system charges. But you just really need to know that this is what you pay to national grid to run the really big stuff that, that takes um, electricity around the country on these really high voltages. You then pay um, for the distribution network through something called GEOS, so the distribution use of system charges. This is around half of the network costs, although it does uh, unfortunately across the UK, it varies. But um, so this pays for all those voltage levels from your domestic all the way up to your grid supply point where it meets the transmission network. And then the third element is this balancing cost. So this is called BASUOS, so the Balancing Services Use of System, I think. Um, and that is paid to the energy, uh, sorry, electricity system operator to keep supply and demand in balance. So these are things that are uh, run by that a different side of National Grid now, where it keeps, um, keeps the network running and keeps supplying electricity uh, across the country. Um, so those are just two things to bear in mind when we go into the proposals. So the next slide takes you to uh, a quick description of these significant code reviews. Um, and it really talks about why we are here. So Ofgem have launched the significant code review and Jody's mentioned that it sounds very complicated, but essentially there's codes that write methodologies that tell you how much you pay for network charging. So when they want to make a really big change to that methodology, they call it a significant code review, but essentially it's just a, a change to a methodology. Um, you can make changes to uh, 
Um, the code's just one-off changes. These are sort of called code modifications. Um, so these are those codes are always changing, but these ones are the really big ones um, that have been going on in the next in the last couple of years. And the important thing is that um, Ofgem really wanted to review that. They started this in 2017, and they really want to ensure that that charging structure supports the efficient and flexible use of the network while supporting the UK's transition to zero carbon at least cost. So they've got a number of competing things going on in their minds when they're looking at these significant uh, code review. They're mainly looking at uh, zero carbon at least cost. So that's quite an important, um, the sort of two key objectives, I think. Um, but when they were doing this review, they decided that um, it made sense to break up the network costs into two different chunks of types of cost. So they launched two reviews, essentially. The first is this, or actually it was the second, but that's on my table. The first is the access and forward looking charges review, which is the one we're talking about today. And this is really about the costs they think you can change. You can change by behaving differently on the network. And that is the review that we're looking at, at the, um, today, and that's what the proposals are about. Just to note that they also had a review called the Targeted Charging Review, which is now concluded, and that was looking at the residual charges. So that was looking at how they could make, they could ensure users paid fairly for the costs you can't change. Um, for your most people, the residual charges are or the sort of on the charges you pay in your bill, a lot of those are residual charges. Um, so we're talking this access and forward looking charges tend to be less of the bill than the residual charges. So it's just good to bear that in mind. Uh, so the residual charges have, are now gonna be um, sort of spread evenly and hopefully fairly across all the users. So um, I'll just check I've covered everything I need to do. So. Just to flag really that this main thing of what we're talking about today is the access and forward looking charges review. So this is Ofgem looking at the costs you can change by behaving differently. And they really want to bear, bear in mind how they can support net zero at least cost. And that's their main driving force. So moving on to the next slide, which is the next of the introductions and we'll go to questions after this. So this is, um, if anyone has attempted to read any of my blogs in the past, it, a lot of it, it comes around uh, access, connection boundaries and shallow charges. So that's all quite complicated, but it essentially is about how much a customer is going to pay to connect to the network. So this is about how much you're going to pay when you want to start a new project, when you want to put in an EV charger, when you want to put in some PV. Um, and there are two different ways of charging people for that at the moment on the network. If you're on the transmission network, so if you're really big, if you're Hinkley Point C, you pay shallow charges. And this essentially means that you just pay for your sole use assets. So you just pay for that wire that goes directly to the network. Once you're on the network, any impact of you being on that network is is socialized across uh, charges and you don't pay for that directly. You, you and everybody else will pay for that um, in those uh, charges in that bill, in the uh, sort of domestic bill. But the way that it's currently done on the distribution network is different. It is called shallowish charges. And this means that you pay for your sole use asset. So you pay for your wire and then you pay a proportion for of the impact that you're having on the network. So you pay a little bit towards the reinforcement and the upgrades to the network as part of that cost to connect. Um, and at the moment, the shallowish is about the fact that you only pay a proportion of that cost, depending on how much you have triggered. And that you, you pay for the cost of your uh, of the impact on the voltage that you connected. So if you connected at low voltage, you will pay for part of that reinforcement. 
uh, and then you will also pay for part of the enforcement at the voltage above. So if you have then caused a knock on impact to a higher voltage, you will pay for that. Now, if you then cause a, uh, a knock on to an even higher voltage, you no longer pay above that second level. So they call it shallowish. Um, and that is the uh, connection or the sort of the methodology that calculates your connection costs at the moment on distribution. So just to flag at the moment, essentially transmission pay on a, in a different way to distribution. And that is one of the things that Ofgem wanted to look at in terms of this review is, is that disparity causing any problems? Is that unfair? Uh, and should that change? Um, so I'm going to stop there because I know I've covered a lot of technical bits and to see if there's any questions before I go into actually the proposals. So if you'd raise your hand if you're on video or use the raise hand function on Zoom, that'd be really helpful. Um, to recap on what Poppy's saying, you know, essentially if you're connecting large generator onto the transmission network, which tend to be fossil fuel generators, you, we all pay. And if you're connecting a small distributed generator, which tends to be low carbon in these days in terms of like what's being connected, renewables generation onto the distribution network, you're paying a higher proportion of the cost of connecting that. So any questions on that? And if you could please make sure that your name in Zoom, and um, if you click on the top right hand corner of your window, make sure your full name and your organization is listed so that I can pick on you for questions because I can see I can see you raising your hand but I can't see what your name is so see Deeves Deeves uh, Deeves you were right first time, Jody. <laughs> hi oh, this is a relatively simple question um Poppy um at in shallowish regime are any of those charges at either of the two levels capped as a proportion um, of investment or are they just absolute cost and and what is the process by which they're determined or arbitrated yeah. so they are capped but in the wrong way for a user <laughs> essentially so there is something um so you will pay so say you are um a you're you're going to have a, a five megawatt scheme and they say they need a new 10 megawatt substation uh, you are likely to pay half the cost of that substation because you're using 10 and there's another 10. So uh, uh, the, the costs that they that they calculate will be, you know, what they need to change on the network. And then you should pay your proportion of that. So again, if you if you're just a domestic customer and they have to upgrade their substation, you're one of 250 people on that substation. You'll pay one 250th of that cost. Um, in theory, it, I, I don't know the actual detail of how they calculate that costs. But one important thing to note is that at both that voltage, your voltage level and voltage above, there is something called the high cost cap. And this is not to this is to protect uh, other users, not new projects. So essentially, if your project causes costs of above two hundred pounds per kilowatt then the, the high cost cap kicks in and you pay the full cost of, of that reinforcement. Um, so th this is essentially to try and put people off doing things that cause very high cost changes to the network. So there is a cap, but it, it's not for you, it's for uh, the network. The kind of deterrence pricing model, isn't it? Yes. Uh, so how does, a group or an individual wishing to attach when they're presented with the cost by their DNO, how do they actually validate or arbitrate those costs if they disagree with them? That is a very good question. Uh, you can, um, and, and there's, there's actually a sort of, it's a, I think it's some sort of market failure essentially in that a lot of people are, are, do not have the skills to be able to challenge uh, these sorts of quotes that they get back. We do know there are some organizations you can pay lots of money to, to look at in detail and have detailed conversations with WPD or others and try and challenge that and try and get that cost down. You can also, within your quote, you will have challengeable costs and non-challengeable costs. So you can have costs that you could 
uh, you could put that out for tender and you could get somebody else to do them. It doesn't have to be done um, by the distribution network. So um, there are ways to get the costs down, but it, it is it is hard and it's even harder for local energy and community groups because you you don't have that um, th those skills necessarily. Yes, it's, it's that market failure element that interests me. I mean, is, is that being addressed in this review? Well, we'll I'll go through the proposals next and, uh, and then we can, we can pick that up um, perhaps after that. Okay, we're going to move to Fuad because he's had his hand up for a while. Oh, I've unmuted. Okay. Um, yes, it's, it's really the question that, I mean, this comes up every time and I do ask the question many times. So I've been on a lot of presentations uh, from Ofgem and others and, and this caveat at lowest cost is, you know, is undefined for me. Uh, it could mean anything and it, it's used sometimes to avoid the, the you know, carbon reduction objective. So what's your feeling about which has got the stronger drive? How serious are they about lowering? Um, are you asking Regen or are you asking WPD? Because we, this is a WPD well, funded forum. I'm so asking we are giving I'm, our views. <laughs> I really want to understand that because I've seen, I've heard of Jem uh, on, on several webinars where this the carbon objective is put up first and then just completely ignored mm -hmm. yeah so it's just a it's just a headline but actually it's not being implemented yeah i, I can i can give you a quick view on that and this would be a, a regen view when we started this about three four years ago it was very much put it up there and then take it down and think about economic efficiencies particularly on the network so i think as it has moved on, that objective has become higher um, and they have started to talk about the most efficient. So they used to talk about mainly the efficient use of the network. And now they're talking about the most efficient use and development of the network. So that is really important. That used to be like objective eight on a list of 10 and now it's the sort of top. So it has changed as they've gone through. And I think they are now more aware of the the question about least cost is one that needs to be applied to the entire energy system and not just the particular bit they're looking at at that time. So again, I think that has started to change a bit and they are open to those messages. If it is least cost for our whole net zero energy transition, uh, but is more cost for one part of it, then that, they, that is an argument that I've heard more. So I think that's where this particularly applies in terms of um, it's not just least cost for the network. And, and that's something I do think it's important to keep pushing as a, as a message is that it's likely that the cost of the network will go up, but the broader cost will be, be least cost for the system. Brilliant. So. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think we're starting to see that terminology changing, but it, there is still a kind of hangover of least, you know, it is more about least cost to the consumer today rather than least cost to the consumer long term. But I do need to say that some of these changes are starting to move in the right direction in terms of enabling more low carbon generation onto the networks for our future. Um, C. Deves, I don't know what your first name is, so could you please... Um, change your yeah I can be um, I'll change your myself as Chris Chris hi Chris yeah, hi, nice Chris. to meet you can can I just ask you to post your question into the chat um yeah, yeah. because of time so we're going to use yeah it's now. just a quick it's just a quick observation on Fard's point okay there is a I think with all due respect to all those present a a another failure in this market that the all the documents I read from Ofgen are clearly written by economists for economists. And economists use the words like utility and low cost in a very special way. Um, from the time they first start studying economics at A-level, they're taught about utility costs and so on. The, the idea culturally in the community of economists inside Ofgen of what a cost is and how it is reduced is probably not representative of what the true cost is to the country. And I think there's a real terminology error here that needs to be addressed. That's all I really want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. 
Okay, um, Poppy, we're going to run through a yeah. bit of network connection charging changes for demand and generation. So there's some quite big changes in here that will affect all of you and the projects you're working on, and Poppy's going to talk you through those. Right. Next. Yeah, so this is the, the big thing. So just to remind you about that shallow and shallowish. Um, so uh, the Minder 2 decision has come out and they want uh, responses back by next Wednesday. And they say in their Minder 2 decision that they feel this shallowish boundary created a barrier to investment for projects on the distribution network, which we would very much agree with. Um, they think that this means it customers connecting some customers pay some really large costs whereas the ones before reinforcement didn't and the ones after didn't so there's a sort of unfairness inequality uh, with the shallowish charges and the, <clears throat> the arrangements on distribution as we've flagged are different to transmission and that's inconsistent and really importantly um I love this quote that came out within the review. They felt the current arrangements contribute to DNOs taking an incremental and reactive approach to reinforcement as a means of facilitating new connections rather than investing in the light of anticipated wider network needs. This is essentially, they were required, uh, the DNOs, to quote on a project by project basis um, so whenever a project came up, they said, well, it will cost you this much. Uh, and then another project probably came up in the same area and they said it will cost you this much. So there is a very strong, I think, economic argument that this sort of incremental approach, project by project, um, changes that the DNOs were sort of compelled to do through the shallowish charge uh, is very inefficient in terms of strategic investment and wider uh, network investment. And so it's a really positive statement that they, um, that they have felt that this system and the shallowish system has created potentially that barrier. Um, so we'll just move on to the next. So we're gonna go through quickly. There, this is the big stuff. There's lots of other stuff in there. But one of the first decisions they make in their or their proposal is to make the demand connections at distribution shallow. So this would be to make them consistent with transmission. So I'm sorry about the complicated diagram, but essentially uh, this shows that there were four things that you, you had to pay for as a demand connection if you triggered um, a reinforcement, you had to pay for your assets. You had to pay for reinforcement at your voltage level. You had to pay for reinforcement at the voltage level above. And if you were really large, which doesn't happen very often, you would have to pay the full cost of your impact on transmission. Um, so their proposal essentially, which we think is very positive, is to remove the requirement to pay for reinforcements at the voltage level and the voltage level above. So essentially making demand Fully, fully shallow. I think they're still keeping the transmission attributable costs, but this is very unlikely to apply to a, a lot of demand customers. Um, so we think this is quite a significant change. Just to notice for demand, there is no high cost cap. So the high cost cap that we mentioned earlier is, is particular to generation uh, and not to demand. Um, so we've got some examples that WPD have worked through on some example of, of some connections that they'd had in uh, recently. I don't know how they chose them, but it's really interesting that, that doing a sort of average of those, it came out as a sort of 50% reduction in the cost of the upfront cost of the connection. You can see at the HV here, you've got a couple of car chargers. EVs were a really big driver for this. Uh, and you can see one has dropped from 900,000 to 200,000, another from 100,000 to 10,000. So these are really quite significant drops in the cost of an upfront connection for demand. Um, and yes, and that is the impact essentially of fully shallow. Just to note, there will be quite a lot of demand that wouldn't have triggered reinforcement. Uh, they will just have sole used assets and they pay that. This, this is not what uh, this that they looked at, they looked at demand that did trigger uh, reinforcement. 
And um, so you have to bear in mind, there's probably a lot of demand connections that, that wouldn't have had reinforcement um, applied to them anyway. Um, but yes, some really interesting numbers there and really quite significant falls. Okay, so this is good news for anyone who wants to connect heat pumps, EVs, um, perhaps if you've got a new housing project and you're still um, creating those higher level transmission reinforcement needs, then you might still have a cost there. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's really significant. There's, there's, you do need to pay attention to the fact that you still need to pay sole use assets. Uh, so that will still be significant in some places uh, and there will still be a cost to that. Um, for things like, yeah, this will also impact people like that want to expand their factories, they want to expand, um, they want to electrify a process, or um, if you've got a whole load of new housing, in the past they might have gone, we can't get the capacity, for example, to put car chargers on everything and we can't get the capacity to put in heat pumps. Uh, this should allow that, that to happen. Um, I don't know if we stop there. Should we go to the generation, the next slide, to show you the slight difference with generation? So yeah. let's. So that's demand. So the other proposal that is a really big impact is the minded to make generation connection shallower. So what they've proposed here is to remove the requirement to pay for reinforcement at the level above connection. Um, so it's not as shallow as demand, or that's their proposal. And also we sort of flagged here, there's a key question in the consultation about the high cost cap. And they would, uh, I think they're very minded to keep the high cost cap at the level of the voltage level of connection. And they're asking a question in the consultation about whether to keep the high cost cap at the level above connection. Uh, so that's a really important point for the consultation, we think. Um, and we've got some, some thoughts about that if you are interested. So we've also got some examples that WPD have put together for the impact of that on um, a generation uh, connection. So you can see it's a lot more uh, variable. You've got some that have no change at all and some that have really significant changes. Um, so it's just an example here. You've got some PV, a 10 kilowatt PV connection, which is a very small sort of rooftop scheme, goes from 7,000 to 600 pounds. Um, but then you've got two megawatts of PV that clearly either has a hard sole use asset or um, a voltage level uh, reinforcement has stayed at 121. And um, the gas generation facility here uh, is getting a reduction of 26%. No, it clearly triggered some reinforcement on the level above. Um, you can see at the EHV, there's a very significant reduction for this PV and battery scheme. Um, but then there's another one at 132 where there's no change at all because it triggered that transmission um, reinforcement. So you can see it's, a, it's, it's much more changeable, but there are, for some, particularly the examples here, the low voltage seem to have quite significant benefits from, from that reduction. It's worth mentioning, I think, that this was calculated removing the high cost cap from the voltage level above. Um, so that there is still some uncertainty about how much that reduction would be. So I think we have the next, I think it's useful to go to discussion next, but the, just to flag the key consultation questions on these connection boundaries. So there are three questions really that we would recommend looking at. Do you agree with a proposal to remove the contribution to reinforcement? Uh, and do you think there are arguments for going further for generation under the current dual arrangements? So, um, they, uh, I, I'll go into us later if people have questions, but I'm not going to go into that just now. Um, but essentially, um, they have an objective to change GEOS in the future. Um, and it may be that once that's changed, they would take generation shallow. Um, but at the moment, they don't um, think they um, want to do that. And that you can, I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, what are your views on how effective the current arrangements are in facilitating efficient development and investment on the distribution network? So 
Regen's perspective, we're really interested not just on how this impacts individual projects, but really how this impacts how the network develops, how WPD and others are able to strategically invest in the network for the future. And that's one of our really key uh, areas of interest. And then the question three, what are your views on whether we should retain the high cost cap, which we think is quite important uh, in terms of the generation uh, decision? So I think I'll stop there. Sorry, JD, for that. Was no, that's, <laughs> that's fine. Um, does anyone have any questions? And I will only, once again, I will only pick on you if you've got your name in your box. So um, I'm going to give it a minute to see if there's, because Fuad has already asked a question. Is there anyone else who hasn't asked a question who would like to? Okay, Fuad. Yeah. Oh, Peter. Sorry, Peter. I didn't see you. <laughs> Peter, let's go to Peter and then Fuad. Uh, thanks, 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 Jodie and Poppy. Um, I just could you clarify uh, the difference on the generation side between the shallowish and the shallower in terms of the uh, costs for improving at the current, at the existing um, uh, voltage level? Um, the wording wasn't quite the same between the two, it says some costs. Does that imply that there's a difference that in, in that, or are they, is it taking effectively the same approach as they were before on the, the same voltage level? And, and, a, and, and a, an additional question, which might be related, the two megawatts of solar PV, um, what were the criteria that, or assumptions that determined that there wouldn't be any reduction in that, whereas there was a reduction in the seven megawatt gas. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as I understand it, they were looking at the methodology for how they calculate, how they divvied up the cost uh, between the network and the project. I don't think they've made any changes to that. So right. I think you'll see the, 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 the voltage level uh, reinforcement cost will be the same um before and after this change as far as i'm aware i don't think there were many changes to the methodology um so in terms of that there is a bit more detail i just did a, a summary of um, the information that wpd sent to me i think that two megawatt pv required a new line uh, to connect it so it was having to string a new line and for them that didn't change uh, because it wasn't trig it wasn't the main the high cost was not a uh, reinforcement at the level above cost. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. What? Um, yeah, well, I have an observation and a question. So the observation is the one uh, that Peter just mentioned. Is it really these examples are almost arbitrary, especially on the generation mm -hmm. side. So <laughs> you could make it look like anything you wanted. So without the detailed knowledge of what's happening and what's included and not, to me, they're meaningless. Sorry to be so harsh. Is there um, something you would recommend instead that would be more helpful? Well, yes, of course. I mean, if you give if you give the detail, and there may be the detail, obviously we don't see it in the charts here. There may be the detail of each example, which we can then look at and make a more meaningful comparison. Yeah. I didn't put the detail, there is more detail in here um, that I we can check that WPD are happy for us to send out to you in terms of an explanation for why there wasn't a reduction or why there was a reduction. Quite a lot of those explanations are just, it did or didn't trigger reinforcement at the level above. Yeah, so you can pick examples which show it in good light or in bad light or... Of course, yeah, you know, I think so you've got to be careful with that. I think yeah. that's the that's actually I'm not sure it was about picking examples to I think what they are illustrating here is that for some projects this could be really significant. Mm. And for some projects this could have no impact at all. Mm. And I think that is something we need to take away. I think that's actually a really key point. I think that's um, the only key I think that's the only point. Mm -hmm. And we understand where the costs are going to be reduced. Yeah. yeah? So clearly yeah. there are no increases in cost, yeah, apart from inflation. Yeah. Um, my, my, my question is sort of a bit, little bit tangential to this, but it's, I, think, I think it's important. So these uh, changes, when, once they, we've done the consultation and gone through, to what extent will they enable or prohibit the eventual smartness of the grid where we can do local balancing 
more and and you know all that stuff that well i think we really need it, 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 do you feel that these well, we, do we need another review to address these because obviously the, the once you have local balancing then the impact on the network will change i'm assuming that these the proposed changes the minded two changes will in, allow that to happen that's really the question yeah, I think that's that's a really good question, and uh, I will go back to the um, the mention of Duos that I uh, I glossed over. So when they did this review, they wanted to look at access, which they've done, but they also wanted to look at Duos. So how your the distribution use of system costs, so how you're paying for the network annually, so everyone how everyone is paying for it. Um, they really wanted to make that GEOS cost more locationally specific, more granular. At the moment, it's very, you know, it, it's just socialized across the whole of the, uh, the network. They looked at some options for that. They could not decide at the same in the same time period. And so they have gone ahead with these access changes ahead of any changes to GEOS. Um, so we, this is only part of the review and another part should be coming out which says about how the annual changes, annual charges will change. Um, whether or not they support balancing flexibility is still an open question, however. Um, in theory, yes, but um, in reality, maybe not so much. What the, the interesting thing that we do think this will do is, is we say strategic investment in a in a, in a sort of all-encompassing term. Um, if the network, for example, aren't required to recharge this cost directly to a project, it does open up the potential for WPD and others to manage the networks um, uh, with flexibility as well, and potentially take some slightly different ways of having to balance or avoid reinforcement or do something else other than reinforcement that because they in at the moment have to give a quote and charge a particular project is is harder to achieve um, so we're hoping that this whole change should allow the the networks to, to to think more strategically but also invest in flexibility um, and potentially things like local balancing um, but it is still up in the air I'd say about yeah. how much that will happen. So it's yeah. a question of where are these uh, all these savings going to be paid for from where? And, mm. and you know, this is the, the follow on. So it's, I'm glad you say they're thinking strategically. Well, they're also waiting to see what happens with the development of flexibility markets, because yeah. we've talked a lot in these forums over the last few years about how those markets are evolving. They're still evolving now. And so part of the reason they're delaying what they think is going to happen with those is because they want to they don't want to have a negative impact on new flexibility mm -hmm. market. I think if you, it, so John, we John if you just allow me, oh, uh, I think maybe just to add to what you're saying there, these proposals are just aimed, I suppose, at looking at how WPD and indeed other DNOs can facilitate uh, what has been an already difficult position for customers to connect to a system. So it is looking at how can we suppose reduce some of the connection charges as a way of encouraging customers to connect to the system. So as, you, as you've seen already, we are moving from a situation where a customer pays for his Soyuz assets, as well as for part of the reinforcement costs that are attributable to a particular voltage level. So this is looking at how, how we can potentially move forward from where we are today to facilitate um, the new connection. And I think the question of local balancing still remains, but I think it, 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 as far as I can see, it's not dependent on these changes or these proposals. Thanks, Fatal. Right, um, we've got Dick, Alan, and Dave Green. So Dick first, and then Dave. Yeah, good morning. Um, I was wondering about, um, you know, generators, say solar farms with uh, batteries. Um, obviously, you've got a generator and the battery is of demand. 
so how does the the charging change you know uh, with a with a, a generator connection and a demand connection such as a battery how, how do they take that into account when costing the connection so they've given a very straightforward response on that, that they said that if it's, they'll treat demand as demand, so that will be shallow. So the demand part of the battery will be a shallow charge and the generation part of the project will be uh, the new, uh, new regime. Yeah, but it's usually connected through the same connection. So obviously, you know, you might want to use the battery to export at one point, mm -hmm. as well as the, say, the solar farm. So, you know, with, with the two the two types uh, using the same connection, I'm just wondering how they're going to split up the cost uh, between demand and generation. Jenny or Faithful, would you like to chip in there? So um, actually can can generate and export that it'll be it'll have that generation cost as well yeah okay um but i've got another question if i can jump in Is please. It a quick with, one <laughs> yeah the, 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 with the voltage rule um you know with uh, only paying for reinforcement for for the actual connection voltage Will, will DNOs be tempted to connect at higher voltage, um, you know, to, to um, so the, the, the generators paying for the reinforcement costs, you know, that they're supposed to um, charge at least cost. And I'm just wondering, with re removing that, will, will they be tempted to, say, go for an LMKV connection rather than an LV connection? Uh, I, I, I think from my understanding, the ability or the, I suppose, the, the decision for a DNO to connect to any particular voltage level depends on the availability of capacity at that particular uh, uh, point. So I don't particularly think that the fact that these changes are coming in will determine at what voltage level you're going to connect. I think it is solely down to the availability of capacity in a particular location. I think okay. it's worth noting that the, the, the DNOs won't be paying for either. Uh, they will be charging you through Duos. So whether you they get it, they should be okay with whether they get it from the project or whether they get it from their Duos charge. They will get that money back. And it's worth remembering as well, like, you know, we have been reiterating for well over eight years that if you are wanting a connection and you're given a particular connection offer, you know, there are contestable and non-contestable bits of work in there. Yes. But equally, yeah, yeah. there is also the opportunity to go back to that network planner and say, are there any other possibilities here? Are there any other options? Because, yeah, that's right. you know, it is very difficult for communities to connect to the network when you don't you're not a developer you don't have your own grid connection expert finding the best places to connect you can't move your project because it is locationally specific by the very nature of being a local community energy project and there are always different ways of of using the network we have in the most efficient way and it's you you, you know most community organizations don't have an electrical engineer to ask the right questions but the network planners are very supportive of in general in most cases that I've seen over those last eight years have been very supportive of communities who want to connect and can usually find alternative options or ways of addressing um initial non-financially viable network connection offers okay yeah. we've had a few people with their hands up for a while so we're going to go to Dave Green next and then we're going to go to Tom Nichols yeah, uh, it reduced cost sounds like a very good thing. Uh, is there any danger that um, the DNOs though will say, "Well, you're not having to pay for it, but we can't pay for it either because we've used up our funds, and therefore, um, <laughs> therefore, we're stymied that way." That we think uh, one of our points in the consultation will be: this sounds great, uh, but we need to have detail about you know, what the requirement is then on the network, because we do think, yes, that is a risk, isn't it? That, uh, that they go, yeah, we're going to do this reinforcement in eight years time uh, and you can connect then. 
Um, so uh, there's a there is that risk. They haven't done that detail. We'd hope that detail will come out that would hopefully remove that risk. I think. Can I just add one more uh, item to the question? I think the role of a DNO is to ensure that they facilitate any connection. Uh, they are not there to hinder any connection. The role of a DNO is to find a way around any, any connection. So irrespective of what the constraints may be, they will try to work with any customer to find uh, the workable solution. So a DNO is there to facilitate a connection. Um, it might be worth um, just mentioning we're talking a bit later about access options uh, and there is in the proposals some ideas of how there might be a way of getting onto the network potentially ahead of reinforcement. Um, so we'll, we can talk about that uh, at that point. Tom Nichols. Uh, thank you. A few slides ago you gave some examples of costs for demand connections. And one of those was an EV, I think one of them was an EV charger. Was there more than one example yeah. of an EV charger? Yeah. Um, they were quoted in um, KVAs. Um, uh, are you able to translate those into um, uh, kilowatt connections? Because I don't know what those, are, what size connections those are. Like, was that a standard residential connection? Yeah, none of those were standard resident. Actually, they were sort of a fast charger hub um, but we can ask, uh, I don't think there was a standard residential EV connection example in what WPD sent us. Uh, we can ask that question. It could be that those haven't yet triggered big reinforcements and therefore they didn't have those examples. Uh, but they have them, right. you know, th them and Ofgem are war worried about in the future that that might happen. Um, and that's one of the reasons they want to, to change that. Tom, have you had okay. experience of getting high connection charges for EVs? Or no, no, it's, I'm kind of talking slightly out of turn because I'm, I'm here representing Energy for All and, and we do generation projects, but what, um, <coughs> I should say we support communities to do energy generation projects, but what what worries me about that is is if, if it is in relation to residential, then if the, if the charge to the household is being reduced, reduced. It's it's not actually being reduced. It's being shifted. The householder doesn't pay. The network operator pays. Therefore, they're going to smear it across all of the customers. Correct. And so those households who perhaps don't have an opportunity to install an EV station because maybe they live in flats um, are going to pay the costs of all the houses. So it's a big inequality issue if that's the outcome of that particular proposal. Yeah, and that has been something that's been raised um, quite uh, regularly. I mean, I think there's the argument is that if the current system stayed, then the costs would be higher because they would upgrade incrementally for each charger, if you see what I mean. Whereas if yeah. they can then go, right, this is a street that's going to have a load of EV chargers, the cost of that upgrade uh, it could be done. It could be done strategically for everyone at once, and that cost will be lower. So I think there's the there is definitely a raise there, but the idea is that this should facilitate a lower increase in cost than okay. what yeah. you might yeah. face in the existing system. If you say to me, does that make right. sense? No, thank thank you. That's great. I, I, I think there's there's probably um, an imaginative mind could find a way to achieve both both of those things. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, Dave Green. Dave, if you could put your camera on as well, it really help. Sorry, you had me. I hadn't lowered my hand. <laughs> ah, you haven't lowered your hand. Right. But we had another question. And Chris, you've posted a couple of comments in the chat and questions. Is there any, have you had all your questions answered? Did you have any other questions? Thank you. I think these are more philosophical questions they go back to this business of who arbitrates cost who decides what the engineering solution is and as you say it's, it's back to access the other thing that um i'm not sure is relevant here but I, i'd welcome poppy's view on how it might be addressed at the moment dnos can't themselves offer storage services 
within the terms of their license. Is that being addressed as well? Because it seems to me you can't divorce renewable generation from storage. They're the same beast. And you're uh, considering part of a market rather I than the whole market. I might defer to Journey and Faithful on that. I know they've been banned from owning them. Uh, I don't know if that's been... Re um, as, as I think as of today, their status hasn't changed. I think TNOs are still not allowed to own generation because you know uh, it's not contained within the licenses. And as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been any change to that condition, unless unless maybe Jenny, do you have a view on that? No, I think I think um, it would if if we were to own storage, it would have to be a very small amount as a sort of um, a minority exception. Uh, there was talk of us being a storage operator of last resource if there was uh, an area of the network where storage would uh, reduce reinforcement costs significantly, but there was no commercial developer that wanted to operate storage in that area. Uh, the, the thought was that we would be able to install the, the storage, but we would be expected to divest it within four years to someone else. Um, so Ofgem obviously want to keep the flexibility market operating as openly as possible. They don't want DNOs to be a player in that market. They want us to buy services from third parties. Yeah, I, I can understand the, the, um, the WPD position. My question was really around whether Ofgem are thinking of reviewing whether your licenses would make that possible. I understand what you mean about um, encouraging operators into the market, but the entry cost to being a significant storage operator as opposed to a transmitter or, or a DNO are very high. Uh, and it, it, in a sense, it's the DNOs that have a, a mature access to the capital that would be needed. So it, it it's really a question of whether off-gem are thinking about changing this rather than WPD's position, which I fully understand, of course. I, I don't think Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, the, I, I think that idea of the fact that market can drive down costs and um, that they like really efficient markets, uh, I would have thought at the moment that, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't consider that. Hey, does anyone else have any other questions on connection charging for demand or generation? No. Okay, I'm going to propose a um, five minute tea break then. We'll meet back here at five past 11 and we're going to then move on to network access rights. Um, so do you have a think about that in the tea break and if you've got any questions, um, have those ready and primed and Poppy's going to tell you a little bit more about the next part of this, of this significant code review. Um, see you back here at five past 11. Thanks everyone. Good.
So welcome back for those of you who are back. You can turn your cameras on so that we know you're here, not just talking to an empty Zoom room. Did anyone find any good biscuits? Or cake? I'm still, I'm still making the coffee, so I'm, but I can hear you. <laughs> Great. What sort of coffee are you making, Fuad? Sounds complicated. <laughs> Okay, Peter, I can see you grinning away. You found some cake, clearly. <laughs> well done, good foraging. Okay, so hopefully you've all had a chance to go and get yourself a cup of tea and found some biscuits or cake or ice cream or whatever floats your boat. Um, we're gonna move on now to network access rights, current and future arrangements. Poppy's gonna kind of give you a five minute run through of the implications of this for you guys. And then we're gonna have a bit of discussion about that as well. Um, so Poppy, over to you. Yes, sorry, me back again, hearing a lot from me. Um, so this is a slightly, I, I guess it, this could be really significant for some people. We think it's slightly smaller. We think the, the shallow charge and the connection boundaries is really important, but there are some other useful and interesting things in the proposals. And one of these is putting in uh, new ways of accessing the network. Um, so at the moment, there are two options to get on the network. You can have a firm connection. So you can basically, you have your connection, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, you can also have active network management. So these are sort of flexible connections. These have been put in place by distribution operators in areas of constraints. And these are essentially, you can get onto the network for a less cost um, and your access to the network that could be constrained if the network needs it. And generally these have been open-ended. So you could be in theory constrained 100% of the time. But the issue with these is not that they don't work. So they've been working quite well, but because of financing and you know, generation projects wanting to get off the ground, they, they can't really rely on these sorts of contracts to get built. And because of the open-ended nature, they could be constrained all the time. And so, um, project financing doesn't like them um, so they have been taken up but they're not um, they're not flying off the shelves I, I guess is one way to put it so Ofgem in the proposals want to evolve that into some different options and essentially they believe the next iteration of active network management needs to have more of a closed-ended uh, contract to it so it has a level of firmness with compensation if restricted more than expected. So the idea would be that your DNO could give you a, a, a flexible connection and say you'll be constrained, you could be constrained up to 5% of the time. If you're then constrained 7% of the time, uh, you would be compensated for the additional two. Um, the other option that they're quite interested in is whether they can move this into also time profiled access to the network where you could get a cheaper connection if you only use it off peak, for example, or, uh, or a proportion of it on or off peak. So they're asking for views on whether they think these new options would be valuable. Um, the other final area to note is that one area we were quite interested in was the idea of a shared access um, contract essentially sharing access with other users. So the idea would be that you could have a um, complementary technology that didn't necessarily need to be on exactly the same site, uh, but would be in a, either a ge same geographical area or feeding into the same substation and that they could share access uh, between them. Uh, so a solar and battery or something like that that you wouldn't necessarily need to actually co-locate them. They um, don't think there'll be that much take up for that, and they think there will be complexities with it. So they have not taken this forward yet, um, but they are looking at sort of piloting that or having a look at what, how that might develop. So yeah, the idea is essentially they want to evolve the active network management system to provide new and different access options. Now, the only thing to note is that there is 
a big question about the interaction between this and your shallow charge or your shallower charge. So whether you would want to take a flexible connection or a, a connection that was restricted if you could just get firm connection because you're not paying for the reinforcement. So one of the ideas in the proposal is that this could be a short term thing. You could, in theory, get a, uh, a flexible connection for a couple of years until you got to a point where the network was then sort of physically upgraded and uh, and then you would move on to a firm connection. So there's the idea that this could be a sort of interim arrangement um, which would allow networks to sort of build up a case for strategic investment, that sort of thing. Um, there's not much detail on how that would work, but uh, we think it's an interesting idea. So just the questions around this part of the consultation are on the next slide, the key ones. So do you agree with our proposal to introduce better defined non-firm access choices of distribution? Um, do you agree with the idea to have time profiled access choices? And do you think there are any more benefits to that shared access idea that they had? Our views as region are, yes, we like the idea of a more closed-ended ANM, or active network management, a sort of more closed-ended flexible contract. Um, we're a bit questionable about the time profiled one, mainly because we think in the future it's actually going to be more about the conditions of the network or maybe even the weather conditions on the day. And so the idea of being able to define today what on peak or off peak or would be is, is, is going to be quite hard. So in theory, maybe, but uh, we're not sure whether actually time profiled is quite the right, right way to define it. Um, and then we're quite keen to see more uh, thinking about whether shared access could help the idea of the sort of local balancing, local energy market, what, what that could contribute to making a better business case for people balancing their demand and generation locally. Uh, so I will stop there and let um, people discuss. Okay, so hands up for questions or you can pop them in the chat. Peter. Thanks, um, Poppy. Uh, for me, this time profiling is actually really, really interesting and really important. Um, and I think we, should, we shouldn't be um, uh, undermining it, perhaps, more strengthening it. Um, so I agree that it, if it's time profiled in a very theoretical sense, then that could be problematic. But the more that we can create a link between generation and demand, surely the better. So if that was more dynamic uh, and was more able to um, kind of look at actual data and potentially also kind of um, uh, um, reduce the costs if you are able to kind of demonstrate evidence because you're generating kind of matching demand or, or whatever it, it sort of fits then surely that's got to be a good thing bearing in mind our need to be more flexible and and create opportunities for generation to be more flexible in line with demand as well i completely agree i i, I think my reservations were exactly the same as yours peter in that i'm not sure at the moment this is conceived as dynamic so i think it'll be between five and seven on a uh, on a weekday uh, would be written into the contract. Whereas I think what we need to see is, you know, a, a more dynamic system. So if you've got, a, I, I thought a hydrogen electrolyzer would be a key one, for example, that it would only be running at full tilt if there was a lot of sun or a lot of wind. Uh, and it's that sort of, is the system that they're planning on setting up going to be able to do that sort of thing, like you said, the local balancing. And I think at the moment it's expected to be quite uh, you know, defined early on in a contract between five and seven sure. in the evening. But, but, it, but I, I completely agree the dynamic system would have a lot of value. But even with the limited um, option, isn't that better than nothing? So uh, what I'm saying is surely we should be welcoming it and saying we it would be even better if, 
um, mm -hmm. rather than undermining it and implying that people don't think that it's a step forward. Uh, because surely, uh, from from a solar point of view, for example, it's gonna um, it should be kind of advantageous um, if we're able um, if we're able to kind of uh, provide uh, supply on uh, during uncongested, more, less congested times. Um, I noticed yes. that Jenny's mentioned that you've got a, a timed uh, WPD have a um, a, a timed connection option already? Yeah, it is It is fairly basic though. It does have just very broad time categories and sort of three different seasons that it operates over with, with different amounts of constraint over those three groups of different months. So it, it is fairly basic and it's not responsive, but that's, that's really what the more sophisticated uh, systems, so the soft in strip and A&M, that's where they they evolve from the the very basic timed connection option. A&M so, is active network management. Sorry, yes. yes. So do, do, do WPD offer that as a matter of course? I've not seen it ever offered. It, um, or do you have to be proactive and say, oh, what about this option? It's what's termed as an alternative connection. So you, you can have a, a quote for a, a straightforward connection where it's just a, all of the normal rules apply in terms of reinforcement, or there are a set of alternative connections. As I said, this is the, the simplest uh, alternative. And then uh, for, for networks that are suitable, there's something called a soft intertrip, which has a little bit of monitoring so that it only constrains customers based on what the actual conditions of the network are rather than what they're assumed to be at a certain time of day. And then active network management is managing a whole area of network and it's analyzing the actual inflows and outflows of power second by second over that network and only constraining generation to the, the minimum degree required to keep the network healthy. So, sorry, just one, and then I'll shut up, Jody. sorry, just to just clarify, Jenny, um, what uh, what I was asking was, do you, do network engineers recommend those alternative options as a matter of course? Oh yeah. yeah. Or do you, as a generator, need to? I, I'm aware of them, uh, the, the things that you've outlined, but I've never had a network engineer offer them. Is that because they weren't relevant for, our, or do we, as potential connection customers, have to say, oh, what about this option, or what about that option? Honestly, I, I, I would expect the connection engineers to, to go through the options at a, a connection surgery or something like that. But Okay, thank you. <laughs> certainly, I mean, they're, they're all on the website. They're not hidden. They're in our news. No, no, I, I appreciate that. I think the point here is that that would be really helpful if WPD could make that a policy that these are offered as standard because communities won't know to ask for those things, even though they are on the website. We have talked about them at forums. Not everyone will have access to that information or know to ask those questions. And so a way that WP could support communities and community and local energy generators to connect would be to offer those as standard. Um, so that's certainly a recommendation that I'd be putting forward from this forum. Um, there's a couple of other people with their hands up, um, but I'm gonna pick on Gwen, who's put something in the chat. Um, because all the questions we've had so far are from men. So Gwen. <laughs> Thanks, Jodie. Hi, everybody. Um, well, it's a really an open question that I just would like to moot, really, because I think that when you look at the solution for the growth of the network and balancing and so on, I think some of the very innovative and very distributed solutions that can come from the communities might not necessarily be factored in from the outset because they're a little bit more perhaps complex. Um, and I think it would be very interesting. I just kind of wanted to raise it if it's something that, you know, this group might like to take forward. I'd be very interested to perhaps um, have a focus group where we could sort of have a kind of like an, almost a design sprint and think, you know, what's what's the response to that particular aspect of the consultation around, you know, because I think we probably in the time frame we've got, we may not have time to be able to give anything sort of concrete, but we can certainly say, well, we feel as community developers that, um, you know, community energy um, practitioners that, that there will be some solutions which are, are very distributed of nature that involve a multitude of different technologies 
that communities are perhaps uniquely positioned to be able to engage with and but we might need to have some sort of a list of things that people that stakeholders you know these stakeholders here and others might be interested to sort of explore and take forward because I feel like there is potential there. Ordinarily Gwen I, could, I completely agree with what you're saying but the timescales of this consultation are next Wednesday and um, that's really the purpose of this forum is to explore some of those ideas here because this is the time we've got available to, <laughs> to kind of explore those. Um, so Certainly anyone... the, sh the shared access would be something that I think would be really interesting to look at. And that's something they've sort of slightly kicked into the long grass, but are keeping open mind on. Um, so I think there would be potential in the future to talk about how that might work. So yeah. but a simple response at this stage to say, we feel that, you know, as a community response, we feel that there is definitely potential for more in the way of shared access and that's something that we'd, we, we would like them to really take forward and consider rather than just discard at this stage. Mm. Yeah and ask them to set up a working group on that to explore those ideas further that could be in your response um, and further to that um, you know Regen we will be publishing our response Poppy's writing it and at the moment much of that is based on on what Poppy put in her market insight report which we will send round um or her blog on this which we will send around with the slides um but peter that was i think that was your question in the chat so uh, you've had your hand up for a while and then chris uh yes thanks uh, jody uh, so uh th this question about uh, the flexibility um, arrangement with the connection i'm uh, you may have said this because i missed a little bit but I assume that if you have a contract that it's not fixed forever, surely, I mean, it has to be within the contract to allow it to be flexible in the future. So to me, that's sensible. And this is where, if you have the right uh, attitude about carbon reduction as a priority, then you would favor uh, low carbon generation over other non-low carbon generation when it comes to relaxing the access. I mean, to me, this is the kind of policy that really should be coming from Ofgem and implemented by WPD. <clears throat> but in terms of the flexibility of the contract, I think it goes without saying that it should be flexible. And prioritizing uh, low carbon. And prioritizing low carbon. Yeah. So I hope, I hope, I mean, that's a really good point. I would echo that. And I would hope that all of you here would be putting that in your consultation response. It's something we've been arguing with <laughs> with Ofgem for a very long time. And it is worth noting as well that all of these changes, while some of them, as we've identified, are going to be beneficial for low carbon technologies, they're also beneficial for fossil fuel generating technologies. And we have, you know, an example of a gas connection in here. If those gas connections are connected in your communities, they are taking up capacity on a valuable network, which we are all paying for. And that limits your ability to connect to more low carbon generation in the future. So please do, um, you know, think about that in, when you are responding to Ofgem. Chris. Thank you. It's this local, it's this relationship between local generation and local supply that lies at the core of this. Um, one of the assumptions that seems to be going on here is that this kind of thing can only take place within a DNO patch. Um, for instance, I mean, you could envisage a kind of pairing scheme whereby a PV scheme on one shard of the country was paired with an offshore wind scheme on the other, and the, the two together were contracted to, well, to whom in that case? That's the point, because one will be contracted to a DNO, one will be contracted to another DNO. So that kind of larger scale macro balancing scheme can't be operated within this model. And that seems to be a real weakness um, because otherwise you're relying on the transmission network to sort this out. And that's not appropriate because it doesn't work at the voltages you're, you're working at. So it's a rather strange situation. The other point, going back Poppy to your point about um, hydrogen electrolysis, one of the things we have in Shropshire is simply to tightly co-locate large-scale generation and electrolysis and simply pump every single electron we can into hydrogen unless we can sell it to the grid at a profit and it, it's it's that kind of thing that we can't seem to do here 
it's still very much around the classical model of the grid rather than new um, architectural models of the grid um, and its infrastructure and that seems to be a bit still a real weakness that people are reluctant to address. And how would you like to see that addressed Chris? I, I think I would like to see the ability of any local organization or group of local organizations to to create enterprises for particularly for storage and generation together without reference to the dno um, obviously electrically safe from the point of view of duty of care and hse but only to interact with the grid and the dno as in the areas where they actually are exporting but otherwise to operate far more separately and to be far more imaginative. And I also think um, if Amazon can send me 20 adverts an hour based on a few mouse clicks, that I'm sure the electricity industry can use the technology and big data to provide minute by minute national monitoring over the country. It's perfectly doable. Thanks, Chris. Jenny, would you like to respond on any of that or comment on any of that? Um, we did have a project that, that looked at whether microgrids had any financial benefits to run bits of the network as sort of independent, which I think is what, what Chris was suggesting with sort of having the storage assets and the generation assets sort of working um, without uh, exporting so much to the, to the DNO. Um, but it, it didn't actually work out to have a financial use case that would warrant further development. But I mean that that financial case undoubtedly included a connection aspect on the under the old model, as it were. And our experience is that 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 model doesn't work for small scale stuff. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to grope towards a different way of doing things here, which is is very hard because you have an awful lot of infrastructure that is built in a particular way, and a very sophisticated market that is evolved in a particular way. And really, it has to be undone quite a lot, I think. Uh, off Gem, I, I see are in a difficult position. They're trying to make change, but they're also, they have national duties to maintain a continuity of supply and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's rather a case if I was trying to get to there, I wouldn't start from here. Mm -hmm. So I have sympathies with all parties involved. I'm not trying to just be destructive here, but I think there have to be different ways of thinking about this. Thanks, Chris. Um, Tim Roberts. Thank you, Jodie. Um, my question is re related to a community issue. Um, I live in Marksbury near Bath, and we have two existing solar farms near us within a mile and a half, which one of which is owned by Bath and West community, so Peter will know all about it. We now have an application from a company to put in a 20 hectare farm which is even nearer to the village so recently they um, had a zoom meeting to get people's opinions and i asked you know what are the benefits for the villagers and um firstly they said oh well we'll enhance the wildlife which i take with a pinch of salt and then they said oh well you can keep your sheep there or your beehives but as we don't have any shepherds or beekeepers in the village, uh, I don't know if that's any good. What I would like to know is what sort of things should we be asking for? What, what sort of amount could we expect? OK, bit off topic there. Um, but I think, can we pick that up outside of this forum? Maybe have a chat about that later. Um, you know, communities used to... Um, used to be able to access sort of up to £5,000 per megawatt, but now the business model for solar has changed so much that you're not going to get that these days. Um, but we can definitely have a chat about that outside of this forum. And anyone who's got any advice for Tim on that, if you could post your email address or contact details to Tim in the chat, that'd be really helpful. Um, does anyone... Much. Does anyone else have any questions on network access rights, current and future arrangements? What? This is a, um, just a practical question. Is it actually the charts were very, the slides were very useful 
in helping us respond. Mm -hmm. You'll send them out today? We'll absolutely send them out today, yeah. Um, and we'll send recordings of this forum as well. So if anyone wants to refer back to any of these discussions, you can. So, so our, our approach here is to very much support you as much as possible to, to respond yourself. But this is a kind of numbers game now. We need you to respond directly um, because we need a kind of critical mass here to um to respond we've already noticed the kind of incumbents responding to these and think and already arguing that everything should be kept the same um community and local energy energy generators have been arguing for well over 10 years that we need these these changes to be made to enable more low carbon generation to connect and particularly to enable more democratization of our energy system and so we've been arguing for communities to be treated differently for everyone not to be treated the same because Ofgem have this definition of a level playing field as treating everyone the same and we're arguing you know we have been arguing for a very long time that communities absolutely need to be treated differently because you are locationally constrained and usually the last to connect even though you're all paying for the cost of the network through your bills um, and this disparity as well between transmission and distribution level charges is unfairly, um, in Regen's opinion, unfairly affecting low carbon generation. Chris, please. Yes, sorry, Jody. Uh, these are slightly, I mean, just an observation on your immediate remarks there. I mean, half of Shropshire is off the mains gas network. Mm -hmm. I've just come off a call with people in the, the local authority about how does that affect the way they should be responding to this kind of consultation because it's a, a real issue a more immediate question going back to this question of storage and licenses for dnos if if there were a large amount of storage provided outside of the dno um should we say um bailwick or whatever at what point would Ofgem become interested in it and begin to regulate it Ofgem oh, regulate storage. Supposing, supposing you could get to a situation where, say, a third of the UK's energy actually was, electricity was actually supplied from storage of various sorts at certain times of the year. Is that a matter that becomes a matter for regulation or is it still just free market? I don't know <laughs> the answer. I think, you need to, I think you need to join our electricity storage network forum for that one, Chris. Um, uh, I can try to answer uh, the best I can. Um, storage is considered a generation just like a gas uh, turbine or um, a, 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 a fossil fueled plant. And in terms of whether it can be treated any differently, um, uh, I'm not so sure because if you think about, say, um, let's talk about Dinoic in, in, in Wales. Dinoic is another form of storage, which as far as the definition of generation, it is as considered as, as any other. So I don't think Ofgen per se, in fact, I don't think it's a remit of, of, of Ofgen, it's probably a matter for, um, it's probably a matter for the ENA and other such organizations maybe to look at the best way of, I suppose, dealing with it. But I think on a very broad level, I'd probably say it's not different from any other form of generation. So once, it, once it's I, I would agree with that. Balance oh. mechanism unit, so. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry, there's a couple of people talking there, Jenny. So once once it's uh, exceeded a certain size, it, it's classed as a balancing mechanism unit and is treated the same way as other generation. Yeah. But only if it's connected to the DNO. What I what I'm envisaging, I mean, this is the hyp the hypothetical question. If, for instance, I was able to lay my hands on fifty or a hundred million pounds, and I decided in Shropshire that I would buy every single electron from every producer that wasn't being used um, into the, uh, the national network, any surplus electricity at all. 
and turn it into, say, hydrogen and use that as a, a business, supplying hydrogen to people. At what point does that become something that's of interest to the DNOs? I'm not sure I understand what you're driving at, because if, if you're uh, consuming so much electricity over the, the network that it triggers reinforce, is, triggers reinforcement, then you'd have that connection capacity anyway. You would have... uh, it's just a matter of I mean, taking all the surplus. I mean, I'm not seeking to in, engender engineering change in the DNO's mm -hmm. network. I'm not, I'm not sure of the concept of surplus because the, the electricity network is balanced between supply and demand, so... Yeah, but that, that's back to this architecture model, isn't it? It's balanced, only, as you rightly say, there's an element of the consumer bill pays for that. It's balanced nationally. Yeah. There isn't the opportunity to take local generation and use it for local consumption. It goes into the, the big pot called the transmission system. Um, no, uh, the generation that's exported locally can be used locally. If you, if you, I mean, in the same way as if you have PV on your house, you you can use it in your house, and then if there's any excess, you can export it to your yeah. neighbour. That's that in my house is before it reaches the DNO connection point, isn't it? Yeah, but if it's very very local, it's not local over say. 50 kilometers or something like that it, it depends on the generation if, if you if you export you can export from your house to your neighbors if you're a larger generator you can export onto the 11 kb network and supply neighboring 11 kb customers so i mean the the, the physics of where the electrons flow it, it it does follow that it is you know it does go locally it's it's only if you're a very large generator that you would export onto the national grid OK, well, we'll leave it there. Thank, thanks for that, Jenny. Okay. I think the, the real issue there is the value and where the value goes and how we pay for that. And at the minute, there's no, there's no financial value in doing that at a local level at the moment. Um, Fuad and then Gwen. Um, yes. Um, so um, coming back to the consultation, uh, is, is, you know, there have been several consultations on this and lots of the points that people have raised and I've raised, we actually responded to. So the, que the question, we, you know, the message was put in and, and, but you don't get the feeling that it's being listened to. So I'm interested in saying when you said it's a numbers game now. So the more people respond, I, I really, I mean, you know, I think we made very cogent and, and valid arguments for the points that community energy groups and, and people who are interested in, in addressing climate change have me, uh, make. But it comes back to this overall overarching policy. Climate change is still not the priority as far as Ofgem is concerned. So uh, we will respond for sure. I think it's important that we should all respond. But I just, this is what demotivates people because mm -hmm. I'll just be repeating the points I'm, I made two years ago. Yeah, when DSCR um, started, absolutely. whenever it was, uh, three years maybe. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, you've broken up a bit there at the end, but I absolutely urge you to recycle existing consultation responses if you've already responded on these points to other consultations. Um, and, and say that, say we feel frustrated because we're not being listened to. We have been making these points. You know, I have been personally making these points to Ofgem about fairness in the way we pay for our networks for, for eight years and it is tiring and I do feel that I feel your frustration um, but it is the system we have we're seeing some slight shift in terminology now um, the government have set a net zero target Ofgem are having to think about how the networks can respond to that in a way that is fair and you know the point the, the guy made from community energy, uh, from energy for all was Tom Nichols earlier and um, was talking about that fairness issue, particularly in how we pay for the network. You know, we're all paying for the transmission network and fossil fuel generators to connect. And yes, if, if we're all paying for someone to connect their EV for their house and not for people in flats, that is unfair. But what is fair? How can we make that fairer? And how can we ensure that there is some local value from energy being generated at a local level, which clearly there is an ambition for this net, this sector, community and local energy sector, to want to generate and use energy locally and balance at a local level. So 
but to also receive from that some value from that. Um, Philip, you've had your hand up for a while. So Philip Coventry from Community Energy England. There we go, camera. Thank you. Um, although Gwen was there before me, if you were wanting to go, Gwen. Yeah, I do. Gwen, thanks for pointing that out, Philip. <laughs> Sorry, I missed you, Gwen. It's fine. I think I think it might be too too onerous because it, it might take too long. So it might be worth taking it offline. But but to, simply to say to Chris um, Deeves, I, I I think it's actually a really salient point you've made, and I'd like to understand it better. Um, to, to, to sort of um, try to reach reach a sort of understanding of, of what the what the network response would be to the the emer emerging technologies like hydrogen, which you know we've seen the hydrogen strategy published yesterday, is clearly coming online in the in the next few years, where it will probably be distributed electrolyzers um, taking surplus energy and what that's going to mean for balancing and so on. But thank you, to, you've given your your email. So thanks, Chris. I'll, I'll take that offline with you because I'm very interested to sort of explore that topic and try to understand it better. And please do, if you're happy to share your contact details, do share your contact details. You know, we have these forums so that you can network with each other. And typically, if we're all in a room together, you would be trading contact details. And if you don't want to share them publicly, you can share them via me and I'll, I'll connect you. Um, Philip. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just had a point and then a question. Um, the point is is only about the broader kind of context, and, and um, I am not the so I work for Community Energy England. I'm not the policy and advocacy kind of expert within our team. So uh, forgive me for not being the most informed. But the context that I sort of wanted to point out was was what we, what Julie was mentioning there about the um, the the net zero target set by the government, and then often having to think about how they incorporate that. But it, it's that sense that the, the consultation which we might be looking at that's come out from Ofgen isn't it is so boundary that doesn't allow the thinking space um, to incorporate all of the larger scale stuff that we've been talking about and I think that is an element of the frustration with the process is you're asking us some questions but they are not necessarily the they might be good questions in a small kind of narrow view of this system, but it isn't the big questions. And, and many of you have raised those bigger questions. And I think it's as sort of just observing really, it, it's very interesting how we can put pressure on. And that's something that Community Energy England does and I know Regent as well is try to act in more, from multiple directions and at other levels of, of government because Bay sits above Ofgem. And so Ofgem can't just change the way they see things because they themselves are constrained just as the way that the DNOs are constrained in the way they might be with some of these systems by the, the rules within which they operate. And so it is this kind of multi-pronged approach. And so yeah, just to add encouragement to continuing to put our voice in from our sector as all, all of you have been doing already and sort of saying that you're going to recycle your views and it's because as long as those views are keep being raised and heard, then they're, they're still part of the system and, and uh, of, of thinking about how what not the system, but part of the processes of thinking about how the system can change. And and, uh, and I, I know very well it can be frustrating. You know, it's frustrating for us too. And Regen, I'm sure, who putting putting in these 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 comments and, and making the same uh, sort of input to, to decision processes. But ultimately, we have, we're all contributing to shifting the system more. And yeah, it would be lovely to see things like um, community energy prioritised. And that was my other question really was was coming on to that is um we we talked to other dnos as well and obviously this is a sort of dno specific forum so i was just kind of interested to know um what regen think because i know that jody's i've heard jody mentioned it before and i, and I know it's it's a it's a big um kind of point that regen wants to make about the need to prioritize communities and, or treat them differently so that the playing the playing field is leveled in a meaningful way rather than just a kind of hypothetical way um, and so I was wondering on Regen's view of the likelihood of that coming about and also the DNO so I would be really interested to know whether WPD because I know that that is a really significant constraint or, sh or factor that shapes how you engage with your different types of customers and I was wondering whether you ever saw the likelihood that community energy would would be kind of given some sort of special dispensation because I've heard it mentioned many times from DNOs in our interaction with them that it is it affects how you how you treat community energy. Um, I can, should I give a quick view of where the consultation was maybe Jodie? Um, yeah, go for it. So it was there when this whole process was kicked off, they wanted to 
and make sure they were recognizing the value of, of community energy. That is where shared access came from. Uh, and that is the thing that has been dropped. So from a purely practical, pragmatic way to respond to this consultation, um, I would suggest that that question about shared access would be where you would put in your thoughts. Um, we know that is not the be all and end all of what you're asking for, but we do think it's a first foot in the door of trying to um, achieve a benefit from local balancing. And it is an idea that could be expanded on. Um, so that would be my pragmatic response to the consultation in terms of what the community energy space would like to ask for. I know it's a very small part of that. Um, Can you explain a little bit more about why you think that property? For those of you who don't uh, just uh, just because in the, i guess what i'm talking is just responding to philip in, in terms of the bounds of the consultation so you're absolutely fine to respond whatever you want to the consultation often have spent a long time narrowing down specific you know they can't as anyone can't deal with these sort of huge nebulous things at, at once so they have narrowed it down and these are the questions they're asking you about from a, from a region perspective, we think that Ofgem should need a, a encouraging on some of these points. We think some of them are really significant and positive changes, um, particularly around the shallow charging for demand and the shallower for generation. We think that's actually a significant win. So we would like people to feel, to be positive about that. It's obviously, there's always further that the, the networks um, and Ofgem can go. So, I guess in terms of responding, we would suggest you do stick to some of the questions and obviously we'll be responding really positively to some of those and then pointing out somewhere, some ways that they could go further. And I think particularly for community energy, that little foot in the door on shared access is something that I would suggest in this consultation, in this sort of engagement you're having with Ofgem and WPD, that would be where I would focus the effort um, because that's, likely to have an output. Um, that's not to say that all these bigger points uh, could not be coming up in the future and potentially through duos there's more uh, there might be more glimmers and more changes but it's, it's about being a, a pr trying to be pragmatic as well as idealistic about where you want to go to so that's that's how we'll be dealing with it with the consultation if that makes sense. And I think the more ammunition we can give you know the more examples you can give you know we've we had you know we've we've been having these forums for eight years because we faced network constraints in the southwest before anywhere else in the country other than scotland and um, some of the kind of other ends of the network in wales for example and we were having communities coming to us with wanting to connect 70 megawatts of solar seven sorry 70 kilowatts of solar and getting hit with five million pound reinforcement costs because they were having to pay for transmission level upgrades and and that isn't sufficient to enable us to move to a low carbon system so it's examples like that that we want you to respond with be factual um but also you don't you know do respond to the questions that poppy's outlined you know we've gone through this at great length we've probably spent a lot of time She's written a guide on this for you so that you can understand it as much as possible. She's highlighted the questions that are important, we feel, to you. Um, but you can also ignore the questions entirely if you want to and say what you've been saying for years, which is we need to be treated differently. I think that, that what, where we're worried or where I'm worried is this is a minded two decision. Mm -hmm. it, we think there are some positives. We would like to see those going ahead. Um, but there's always a danger that there's negative, you know, there's, there's people that are pushing for that not to happen. Um, so that's where we think that's, I guess, where we're saying on the numbers game is that even if you think there are loads of places it could have gone as well to being positive about the areas that we do think are positive would be really valuable because if this is not a done deal um, and it may not happen if uh, the positive responses aren't there um, and it's fine to then say uh, but there's also all this other stuff we'd love you to do um, but yeah we would encourage people to be positive on the areas that they think that we think are actually quite a significant step forward and they might have kept the charges exactly as they were for example. So 
an example of that is shallower connection costs for generation. You know, you might say, can we go further on this? Can we remove transmission level reinforcement costs? Because these are the ones that are affecting our projects and the transmission level projects don't have to pay for this and they tend to be fossil fuel generators. So this is disproportionately affecting, again, disproportionately affecting low carbon generation. You might want to argue in favour of low carbon technologies as FUAD has rather than enabling more fossil fuel generators to connect for the capacity issues that we've raised. You know, there are all sorts of ways you could look at this. Um, Philip, does that sort of answer your question? And you had you wanted to hear WP's response on that as well. So does have we answered your question before we move to WP? Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. And then the, the view on your priorities within the consultation is also very interesting to, to know and understand. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's only just the context. So you, you've, you've gone there a little bit. I think it's just sort of mm. understanding is or, or what does this give us in, in their journey? And I know that you're saying that there's, there's we can argue, argue for more and argue for, you know, as some have done today, huge changes to the way the system is constructed and, and understood. And, and, and that that is fine to put at the end of your response and stuff. But yeah, it's, I guess it is just understanding what this does because it feels when you've been talking about some who may be arguing for maintaining the status quo, I think I certainly am not clear on who would be disadvantaged by the changes that Ofgem have suggested in the, the mind of two decision and therefore what kind of um not not it's just who are who are who are our opponents as it were but but what <laughs> does the minded two decision then do for us because if it were put into place is it that kind of actually everyone is really benefiting because all of the different types of if you're generating if you're putting in a commercial wind farm uh, or solar farm or whatever you're you're just as advantaged from the consultation as a community energy and therefore it doesn't actually benefit community energy in a specific way it's just a general way because community energy organizations would would have cheaper connections just as others would at the same level of megawatts or whatever and yeah we sort of how how are we going to get towards community energy specifically building up that that playing field i think yeah i think that's right in that it is a general change uh, and we do think i mean maybe some of the examples pointed this out in terms of I guess some smaller stuff, and I know that communities don't always do smaller stuff, but certainly the smaller stuff may see higher benefits. We think some of these big commercial, you know, this won't be quite so significant for them as a project. Uh, it will be more significant for smaller scale. Um, so we do think not by design, but just by just sort of the realities of, of calculating this, that it, that it should have more benefits for communities. It would also have more benefits for joint and sort of integrated schemes where you're bringing together demand and generation, that sort of idea, because you'll be benefiting from the demand going shallow. Um, so we do think there are elements that would have particular benefits, but not, like I said, by, by design necessarily. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll okay. stop going on. <laughs> so Jenny, did you have any response, Philip, to Philip's question? No, I think you've covered it. So I think Philip was asking for your, you know, your opinion on whether you think we would ever get any sort of special treatment as this sector. What's your view on that? Um, I think in terms of uh, WPD or Western Power Distribution, uh, when an application is received, it is obviously treated in the same way as anybody else. So there's generally no preference or no uh, special treatment for anybody. Um, um, uh, unless I didn't understand the question properly, but that's, that's my take on that. So he's asking what, you know, what, whether you think, whether you can see that happening in the future. Is that right, Philip? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, in the sense that this, consultation gets us potentially yeah. some benefits but doesn't get us towards uh, uh, overcoming the challenges that communities face as opposed to commercial developers and, and um it's sorry just context special i don't, don't need to labor it so it don't don't need to go. And just quickly on uh, the network charging side of things and they have talked about community and local energy before um i would say off gen's view is very relatively strong on that they don't feel that network charging is the place to uh, 
provide benefits or treat people differently depending on different conditions. Uh, we could challenge that, but that is their view at the moment. So I don't think network charging is the methodology by which this is likely to see huge, uh, huge benefits. They would probably argue for other policy through Bayes uh, and, and others. So I, I think that's their view at the moment. Thanks, Poppy. Um, Chris, I can see you've got your hand up but I'm going to ask you to post your question in the chat because we've got five minutes left to cover transmission charging <laughs> each direction of tra travel um Jenny was that a point you wanted to come on quickly just just on, on the previous thing uh, why Ofgen might want to treat everyone the same I, I think they just don't want to end up having to police who is a community energy group and who's not because I can imagine a whole load of commercial developers suddenly rebranding themselves and it would just be uh, <laughs> situation where you'd, you'd end up having to police it an awful lot uh, I can see an issue there yeah and that did happen um when we had uh 10 kilowatts 10 megawatts of solar split fit split feed in tariff projects we had lots of developers registering as community interest companies and having very little community governance or benefit um let's move on Transmission charging, future direction of travel. Chris, if you post a question in the chat, we'll try and answer it. Um, Poppy, you've got four minutes. No, no time at all. Okay, lovely. So like we said, there, there was a part of the review which is looking at the ongoing charges. So the charges you're going to pay every year uh, to be connected, and that would be the transmission distribution and, and how they're made up. So one of the big things in here uh, is that they have are very minded to, and I don't think they're mind is being changed but you can try on charging small generation so generation under 100 megawatts for transmission so at the moment they don't pay to NUOS and they would like them to they sort of pay in a slightly different way but that's not really relevant but they, but they would like and they were very likely to apply to NUOS to small distribution generation under 100 megawatts and up to uh, down to one megawatt so the complicated thing about Tenuos is that at the moment, it's a big charge in Scotland. So I've highlighted where that is a charge. And actually in the south of the country, probably where a lot of WPD's areas are, it's a credit. So if you're a jet solar generator above a megawatt, you, you, this could be positive for you, uh, but it's obviously really negative for some uh, generators in Scotland. Um, what they are, they have said they're gonna do this, but they are going to probably look at the methodology for transmission uh, for Tenuos to, because this is relatively massive change, I guess, for Scottish generators and small Scottish generators. And uh, so we would expect how they calculate that to, to change. And so this graph would change and probably the actual size of these bars will change and you may get a charge in the South and less of a charge in, in Scotland. So it's just a flag that they're going to do that. Um, and uh, the, we think the only thing up for grabs here is now how that charge is calculated, not so much that it, it is going to be um, put on generation. So I'll just flash the questions at you for the next one. So this is our leading question. Do you have evidence that small distribution generation does not contribute to the flow uh, in the same way as large generation? And therefore, should they not be charged consistently? Uh, I think we probably all have views about that, but if you're uh, looking at it on a purely economic basis uh, and a physics basis, I think probably you can't argue that. Um, but we can try. <laughs> uh, and then the next one would be about the threshold. So uh, will tenuous generation, uh, is, the, is one megawatt the right threshold? It's a sort of practical point. Um, but we could argue potentially that it, it could be higher than that. This is not to say, though, there's a bit confused in the consultation as to whether there will be a charge for uh, generators under a megawatt just levied in a different way through something called the EET. So I can tell you a bit more about that in more detail if you're interested. But essentially, it's the point is here that small distribution generation will pay or receive credits for tenuous in the future. Uh, but there's a lot of, uh, of people that are very unhappy about that in Scotland, given that Scotland's an area where a lot of renewable generation is going ahead and has gone ahead, and we rely on that happening for net zero. So this is not necessarily a good thing, even though your solar plants in the south might get a credit, if that makes sense. So that's a really quick run through. 
Thanks, Poppy. Um, that was four minutes, bang on. So does anyone have any questions, comments on that? Anything they would like to understand more about that before we wrap up? Stunned into silence. <laughs> okay, um, Dick, Alan, and then Peter. Yes, it's Dick Allen. Should I go first? Yeah. That the uh, the interested Poppy in the the cost there for the north of Scotland and the the transmission use of system charges. That the, the um, on the left hand side of the graph, um, it's I think it's about thirty kilowatt thirty pounds a kilowatt. I think it, I think they say it's going up to forty six pounds a kilowatt by twenty forty. Is is that an annual cost or is it a time of day cost? What, what, it's, a, it's an <laughs> annual cost, I think. I'm not a nuance expert, just to say this, but it, uh, there's been some calculations that it basically makes all Scottish generation, small generator, yeah. completely unfeasible. Um, and that politically not very acceptable. So we do think it won't be that high in the future and then the methodology will need to change. But how? We don't know and when it will be applied we also don't know yeah it's, it's, i mean if it's 46 pounds a kilowatt if you've got a megawatt uh, generator that's forty six thousand pounds a year isn't it it's a lot of money mm -hmm. and extra cost really yeah it's huge okay yeah. pete just uh wondering whether you, you are able to share your um response in advance of the deadline I'm, I'm just drafting it. Uh, yes, hopefully. Um, I, I guess. I know that's won't... not that's challenging. Sorry. <laughs> but... uh, do people that would like to see a copy um, potentially slightly draft, perhaps um, let us know, and we can send that round. Sort of in confidence, we don't necessarily want it sent round mm. to a lot of people, but we'd be happy to share it with people. That would be great. Version. So and can then we'll you? Probably, yeah. Can you email Kai if you do want to see a copy of our draft consultation and obviously agree not to share it? Tom Nichols. Um, that uh, Scottish problem uh, will, will impact the Energy for All um, projects. Presumably this is a retrospective, so existing generators would pay those charges. Yes, we think so. There might be transition arrangements, but yeah, we think, uh, we think it will apply to everyone. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I think there's an argument to be made that uh, community investors um, thought that the, the regime was going to be one thing and changing it retrospectively is going to have an undue negative impact on community investors. Um, and I think we'll be putting a submission in to, uh, to that effect. Good. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's wrap it up there. Kai has very helpfully um, flashed up the feedback poll. There's a few questions on there. If you could please answer those, it really helps us in terms of understanding how useful this has been to you. Hopefully it has been useful. Hopefully you've got what you wanted and got your questions answered from this. Um, if you haven't, stay in touch, read Poppy's blogs and, um, and read the, the Market Insight reports that we sent round about this and the guide that um, Western Power Distribution have helped us um, write and publish. We'll obviously send the slides and all of the information and details that we've talked about today. Um, but that leaves me really to thank you all for attending. You know, I think it really shows me that this many people can turn up in August on a subject that is quite so technical um, to want to influence how we pay for our energy system, because it is a fundamental issue for community and local energy. And it will really impact what happens in the future. So we'd really, really encourage you to respond to that consultation before next Wednesday and stay in touch with each other as well. Do, you know, use your networks, which you're so good at, use your networks to collaborate and respond on those points that we've discussed today. Um, thank you again to Western Power Distribution for enabling us to facilitate today. Um, you know, without that, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be having this discussion. So thank you to WPD. Um, thanks to Poppy. They're so expertly guiding us through some really technical technical stuff um, and managing to keep it uh, light enough and accessible enough for us all to actually have a decent conversation about it. Um, so thank you. Please do give us your feedback and we'll hopefully see you again soon. And good luck with all your consultation responses um, by the 25th of August. Good luck with that. Take care, everyone. Bye.